Chapter 2 continued. This is part 3, Frequency Distribution Graphs. We're going to take um, our data. Instead of construct a table, we're going to present it in a visual graph for um, consumers of our research to understand patterns in the raw data. So pictures of the data are organized in tables. All have two axes. The x-axis is referred to the, as the abscissa. It typically has categories of measurement scale increasing from left to right. And the y-axis is the ordinate. Um, so we typically see our x and our y. And um, the y-axis is usually used to record frequency. So we tend to have frequency represented here, and then this is our x value, the data that we've collected. <clears throat> General principles include both axes have a value of zero, so we have zero is where they intersect here, and typically we want the height um, to be about two-thirds to three-quarters of length. And that principle is not as um, applicable these days since we use computer applications to construct most of our graphs um, versus using our freehand um, process, the manual process of constructing a graph, but nonetheless we should recognize that there should be this ratio of how this data is presented on the x and y axes um, to demonstrate accurate um, information, and we'll see how when we don't adhere to that principle um, we can distort data and um, try to manipulate those who are consuming the information that we're presenting. So data graphing questions. So based on the level of measurement that we're using, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, again, to review nominal named categories, ordinal named categories that are ranked, interval named categories that are ranked that have equal increments in between categories, and ratio has a meaningful zero that enable us to make ratio comparisons. Based on what type of um, level of measurement we're using, it will determine what type of graph is appropriate. And also we need to take into consideration we're working with discrete. It could be a, a number, number of children in the household, um, or a named category such as the major that's represented. Versus a continuous data, um, examples include height and weight um, in inches or pounds. And given whether we're working with discrete or continuous, we'll also determine how the graph is constructed. Finally, are we describing samples or populations? So for most of our work, we'll be using data from samples, but we should also recognize what if um, the data represents populations? Are we going to use whole numbers or proportions or fractions referred to as uh, relative frequency? So the answers to any of these questions, or all of these questions, will determine which graph is most appropriate. So frequency distribution histogram. A histogram is a bar graph. Um, it requires numeric scores. So of the four scales of measurement, or nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, interval and ratio are the only ones that are numeric, meaning that they, have, uh, they can be quantified. And therefore, we would not use a histogram for nominal or ordinal data. <clears throat> Represents all scores on the x-axis from minimum through maximum observed data values. Include all scores with frequency of zero. In other words, what we're saying here is, again, we have our x values here and a frequency. Um, so even if a value, so that if we have our zero, one, two, three, four, even if the score of 3 was 0, it's still included. It's still included. So if this is 1, 2, 3, let's just say 1 occurred twice, 2 occurred once, 3 occurred 0 times, and 4 occurred 3 times. It's still included, um, even if it has a frequency of 0. We draw bars above each of the scores, as I just illustrated here. And the height of the bar corresponds to the frequency, and the width of the bar corresponds to the real limits, or one half of the score unit above and below for discrete scores. So whether we are using um, discrete or continuous, we'll see the, the whole number in the center of the bar to represent the x value. 
So here's an example. Um, we have our data here. That's our raw data in a table format. And we want to convert that table into a, a histogram. So again, the characteristic of a histogram is a bar graph. But notice there aren't any spaces in between the bar graphs. A histogram is if one value ends, the other one um, begins. So that's very common in um, when we're using numeric values, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? One um, value follows the other. So it's continuous in terms of where one ends, the other one begins. Um, they're all connected adjacent to one another. So let's say this is quiz scores, number of correct answers. And let's say it is a discrete value. In other words, no partial credit. You either get two right, and there's no two and a half or anything of the sort. It's just either you get the answer wrong or right. And so we're going to count those values as a discrete variable. And so these are our x values, and this is our frequency. So we see the score of 5, right? 5 here had a frequency of 2. And we see where that um, is reflected in the height. And down here, we have a score of 1 that occurred once, right? So if I were to draw a line through here, it kind of helps us see the frequency, right, of how often these values occurred. It's another way to visualize. Um, breaking it down into these blocks is actually referred to as a different type of, of um, bar graph that I'll talk about in just a second, a, a block graph to be more specific. But um, I'll show you that in, in a subsequent slide. So again, the value is always in the center of the range or that bar, and the height represents the frequency. So again, this is an illustration of a bar graph referred to as a histogram, a frequency distribution histogram, where we have frequency on the ordinate, and we have our x value, our variable of interest, on the abscissa. Group frequency distribution histogram, same requirements as the frequency distribution histogram, except... Um, the, we draw bars above each group or class interval. The bar width is a class interval of real limits, and the consequence is the apparent limits are extended out one half of a score unit at each end of the interval. So we can apply the concepts of a group, um, excuse me, of a frequency histogram to a group frequency histogram, but the x axis looks a little different, and here's an illustration. So again, we have our class intervals here, uh, represented by our x values. And the ranges are, are denoted on the abscissa, the frequency on the ordinate. And something that we should keep in mind, um, if this is a continuous variable, this value here is actually 29.5 through 31.5. This would be 33. Point five. So where one ends, the next interval begins. The range extends out using those real limits. Um, but again, it looks similar to just a plain frequency distribution or histogram distribution as in the case of a group frequency distribution. So we just recognize that um, the, the range down on the x-axis is actually representing the real limits. A block histogram, just as I mentioned a minute ago, um, a block histogram can be made a, a block histogram. Create a bar of the correct height by drawing a stack of blocks. Each block represents one per case, therefore the block histogram shows the frequency count in each bar. So here's the illustration, and what's different is just that we don't have an official ordinate. Um, the y-axis is missing. So it looks slightly different. It's a little easier and quicker to construct, um, but it's not readily used. So it is presented in this chapter, but we don't use it very often. But if you were to be presented this type of graph, you would recognize that it's referred to as a frequency distribution block histogram. And the um, biggest difference is it's absent of a true um, y or ordinate, the y-axis or the ordinate. And we're just using the x-axis and piling up these boxes above each of our x values to denote how often each of those categories occurred.
frequency history polygons. Polygons are line graphs, so the histograms were bar graphs, and a polygon is a line graph. So we list all numeric scores on the x-axis, include those with a frequency of zero, as in the case that we discussed for the histogram, draw a dot above the center of each interval. The height of the dot corresponds to frequency. We connect the dots with a continuous line, and we always bring that line down to the abscissa. So close the polygon with lines to y is equal to zero, and I'll show you that in just a second. And we can also use this with group frequency um, distribution data, but instead of having whole numbers on the x-axis, we're going to use midpoints midpoints of those class intervals um, and I'll show you that in just a second but just keep that in mind so that we're going to use <clears throat> um, one value that represents the average per se of the of the range of values because for a, for a line graph we can't plot a whole class interval a range of 50 to 59 we need one value that represents the x value so we'll use the midpoint or the average. All right, so here is a distribution, um, frequency distribution table from which we have um, illustrated our data. And again, we see on the high end, um, the value of x equal to six occurred once, that's this data point, five occurred twice, four occurred twice, three occurred four times, two occurred twice and one occurred once. So this blue line um, represents the data, but this line here that brings it down to the abscissa is the appropriate illustration of a frequency distribution polygon. Without these segments here, if you don't include those segments, then your graph is considered incomplete. And the way that we um, determine where to close off that information is we would consider the x value below the last x value presented in the data. So one value less than one would be zero, and we know that the frequency is zero because it didn't occur. That value was not part of the data set. So that's how we construct this part of the line. And then an x value above seven, six would be seven, and it had a frequency of zero, and so that's how this was constructed. So make sure that you always bring down those da um, data points to the abscissa using a value below the lowest value and a value above, recognizing that the frequency would be equal to zero. Here's a group frequency distribution polygon. So as I mentioned a second ago, it's, we cannot plot this value on the x-axis down here. It's not possible with the polygon, a line graph. It is possible with the histogram, as we saw. Those bars extend from um, the real limits. But for a polygon, we need an x value and a y value. Those coordinates coming together is how we construct this line graph. So our solution to that is to construct the midpoint um, of that range. And we can think of the midpoint as midpoint is equal to the average of the class interval. So let's just consider um, the range of four to five. By the way, what is i equal to here? i is equal to, many may say one, but it's actually two, right? Four, five, that's two values. Just a um, refresher of the material we went over in an earlier lecture. So the midpoint, if we just want to construct the midpoint, again, we need one x value to correspond with our y value. Our y value is represented by the frequency. So we would take 4 plus 5 divided by 2, right? The average. We have two values, so we add them together and divide by how many we have. So 9 divided by 2 gives us 4.5. So instead of using this range of 4 to 5, which is impossible in a line graph, we use the x value equal to 4.5, which is right here. And then it has a frequency of 2, and that's how we get this coordinate here. Right? And so the next midpoint, um, 6 plus 7 divided by 2, we get 6.5, and, and that's where this coordinate is coming from. So just to point out that 
we can still construct a group frequency polygon, a line graph, even if we have grouped information. We simply just construct um, an x value by taking the midpoint of that range. And we do the same with um, bringing it down to the abscissa. Again, this, value, this line here extends because we consider the <clears throat> interval above where this one leaves off. So this is 12 to 13, so it would be 14 to 15, and we would take the average or midpoint, so it would be 14 and a half, and that's where this is, right? And it has a frequency of zero. Similarly, in the lower end, the <clears throat> last interval is four to five, so the next one would be two to three. So the midpoint between that would be two and a half, and a frequency of zero, and that's how we bring it down to the abscissa on both ends. Graphs for nominal and ordinal data. So for non-numeric scores, qualitative data, nominal and ordinal scales of measurement, we use a bar graph. So it looks a little similar to a histogram, but one very specific uh, distinction is that it has spaces um, between the bars, so they don't run together where one ends, the other one doesn't continue. We're, they're separated um, without a particular order, would refer to as nominal, non-measurable width, ordinal. So let's look at an example. Here's an example of personality type. Between nominal and ordinal, what kind of scale of measurement do you think we're using? Again, by definition, nominal refers to name categories ordinal rank categories. So the x value is personality time, type A, B, and C. And of course, A, B, and C are ordered, right? But the, they're just um, value named categories. It, it could be something like social major, psych major, criminal justice major. So it's technically a nominal scale of measurement um, because we cannot say type C is any better than B or B is better than C or C is better than A. They, there is no distinction, no order that we can play, place these in objectively. So this would be considered nominal. So again, we have to be able to identify the scale of measurement to determine the appropriate graph, and you will be tested on that. So make sure you understand the different scales of measurement. Um, so all we're saying here is given uh, a survey of different individuals and identifying their personality types, we can see that there were 10 individuals that identified as personality type A, five individuals, right, personality B, and there were 20 individuals that identified as personality type C. Now an example of ordinal, let's just say hmm, shirt sizes. So we need to place an order. Right, and so given the sizes, we have small, medium, large. And given the uh, distribution of people, we may, may see that the highest category is the medium and um, 10 large and five small. So again, these um, values don't connect, the bars do not connect because they're distinctly different categories. And this would be an example of ordinal because it's named categories, but they're ranked small, medium, large. And again, the, the height represents the frequency, how often those values occurred. And I'm going to go on to make a third video, excuse me, a fourth video um, that discusses the shape of a distribution and when we're talking about the construction of uh, populations um, in a graph. So stay tuned for part four of chapter two.